Namaskar. Hello and welcome to Peer Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. Today I get to see the man in person, Major General Rajiv Narayanan. General Rajiv, Namaskar and welcome to Peer Guru's channel. Namaskaram, Jai Bharatam. Always a pleasure and honor, and nice to see you in person, sir. <laughs> Likewise, sir. Uh, General Rajiv, um, I read your book in bits and pieces, so I'm guilty as charged. I didn't fully <laughs> read the book, so but I got the basic idea as to how the Dagon approaches its prey. And, and you have kind of said that this is the mentality or the mindset that China has when it is looking at uh, its adversaries. Um, one question that comes uppermost in my mind, General Rajiv, is, you know, culturally, the two countries go back thousands of years. And India rarely, if you've ever, you know, uh, conducted any campaigns on, on its adversaries, except for the Chora period when Rajendra Chora went in support of a king in Sri Vijaya and, and liberated him. You don't see a lot of those stories where Hindu kings went out and did anything. I would beg to differ mm. because this is what is generally told to us. Mm. The Hindu, you could say the Akhand Bharat, which sometimes Rajnath Singh also mentions. I don't know whether he knows also. It spread from present day Persia mm. in the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Yeah, that, yeah. that area in the east till the central and south Vietnam, that in the west and central and south Vietnam in the east. Mm. Mm. Kyrgyzstan in the north and right up to uh, Maldives and to some extent Mauritius and Seychelles in the south. That was the extent where Sanatan Dharma existed. The kingdom in the central and south Vietnam was known as Champa. Champa. Right. And it finally. Cambodia is Champa Nagari. Champa, right? Oh, no. Cambodia is Cambodge. Oh, Cambodge. Okay, okay. Yeah, from where they made Khmer. And that was part of the Pala Empire of uh, Bengal. Mm. And uh, the famous Angkor Wat and all yes. was made. The Champa kingdom finally fell in 1858. Once the rise of Buddhism came, all these areas became Buddhist. In fact, even up to uh, Kashgar, Khotan and all these areas were part of the Hindu and Buddhist kingdoms. Most of Tibet was also part of that. But then, like I had mentioned in your place, that around 1900 BC, Something has happened which wiped out yes. the Indus Valley civilization. Yes, yes. And uh, what the British... Thermobaric explosion of sorts. It was a directional weapon. Mm. And what they located in Mohenjo-daro, two separate persons. One is a Russian. The other is a Britisher and an Italian archaeologist come scientist. That <clears throat> the fusion of the bricks and the glazing of the bricks is something similar to what was found in Hiroshima Nagasaki blast. And uh, the uh, radiation levels were almost as high as that. So if the radiation level which they did in late 70s, early 80s in Pakistan, when they went and tested that, if that was the level then, imagine what was the level in 1900 BC. So it seems as a some directional sort of a weapon, has it become bad? because Nobody has been able to explain what happened to the so-called Indus Valley civilization. I call it the Saraswati Valley. Yes. And then it stayed with the Indus. What happened? And when you look at our chronology, which is also there, which I discussed with you in your channel on, um, which is there in the uh, Department of Defense US website, uh, globalsecurity.org, you suddenly find for about Almost about 1500, 2000 years, there is a void towards the western portion of India, central mm. and western portion of India, there is a void, no kingdoms. Uh, it belies the fact that in olden days, if the king, neighboring kingdom was very weak and there was a powerful king, he would take over that territory and make that uh, country, uh, the empire his vassal. Nothing like that happened. So, it's a no-go zone. It appears as if it's a no-go zone. Otherwise, if they were uh, strong kingdoms further towards the west, they would have taken over. 
it is only much later that you find the Guptas and others coming up out there and creating their empires. So, there is, uh, we should be clear about our own because the timelines that are given is very debatable. So, that timeline was based on the uh, now, uh, you could say, um, proven wrong. The Aryan invasion theory that 1500 BC they came and gave you no, civilization. That cannot be. That, that has gone. This is barren land. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't prove to uh, the what you have excavated now going down right up to now, of course, latest is 4000 BC. You're going back 5000, 8000 years behind where you find proper civilized excavations of proper uh, societies. But at that point in time, you had gone back up to 2800 BC, which is at a place called Kalibangar, which is on the uh, Ghaggar, which is flows in the bed of… Ghaggar used to be also called Saraswati, isn't it? That flows in the bed oh, of Saraswati. Okay, okay. That is why Ghaggar is considered untamable, mm. because the bed of the Saraswati is so vast that you block it at one place to tame it, it jumps and goes into the other channel that is available. And it was there that this Kalibangan uh, excavation took place because after the to digress a little once we became independent the railway line actually goes straight from Batinda to a place in Pakistan called Mandi Sadiq Ganj. Mm. For that area that was the biggest Mandi. Mm. So all the trains used to go there to carry all the produce. Now post independence was that was not, not there. Yeah. So they uh, near Abohar, they were bending the railway line downwards. Mm. And so towards Kalibangan, when the railways came for digging and laying the railway line, they found these potteries and others, better sense prevailed, they called the uh, archaeology. They did it and they found this beautiful laid out city. And uh, neat roads and no house had an outlet to the main road. Mm. Wow. You would have high windows, but no door there. Doors were always into the lanes that were coming in from the highway and neatly laid out. Like uh, my mind goes back to the way uh, initially Chandigarh was laid out. Right, right. I have been there in mid-70s. It used to be a beautiful town. Now, now no. that kind of planning is not there. Yeah. So, neat roads and everything. You had drains. You had uh, flowing water into your bathrooms. Everything was available there and that uh, dating was 2800 BC. In 68, the museum was ready. Can you believe it? Till date, it has not been inaugurated. What are they waiting for? They don't want to because your education system by the previous system was that 1500 BC you started. This is telling you 2800 BC. How your whole education would have had to be revamped. Whatever you are being taught in your history would have to be revamped. Today, quietly, the West is working on a concept and theory of exodus from Mesopotamia, mm. dating around 2900 BC, to mm. tell you that they came and gave you civilization. Oh. But now again, that goes proves wrong, because the various Rakhi Gadi, Sinoli, now they are going further back. So, everybody has a vested interest in letting yes. kids be. The, so, nobody wants to. They are not even teaching you these things in school. I have learnt it on my own. Digging and finding out and learning on my own. Angkor Wat is one of your biggest uh, temples, Hindu temples, which is there. It is now of late for the last 5-6 years that you have stepped in for the renovation and looking after it and Yes. Getting it done properly. But otherwise, till now, you didn't even bother. You only heard, ha, Angkor Wat, Angkor Wat. But what is this? And even today, there is a question mark as to why that empire collapsed. Some say because of flooding, water, change. I thought change. it was over-engineering and the rivers changed its course. So That is what they say. Changed. That is what they say because they had all the waters around and that it went away and so there was no water available. If there was no water available, if somebody was such an engineering genius to have made this, are you telling me he wouldn't have shifted his capital nearer to the water? Good point. Good point. Absolutely. 
Very true. Sir, sir, just give me one second. Yeah. I'll, uh, pa- we'll just let it run. I just need to make sure the AC is uh, operational. I think it's yeah. not enough. No, it's, I'm perfect. You're, you're fine? You have to look at yourself. You come from a much cooler <laughs> climate. <laughs> you may have to bring it down to 16. <laughs> it was a 25. I just moved it down to 24. <laughs> uh, no, no. For you, you might have to bring it to 18 at least. Uh, That's when it <laughs> no, is no, 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 going sir. to bring that I'm not coolness. That, I'm not that much of a oh, great running, rolling fine. <coughs> <coughs> so, like, similarly, what when we say that uh, we are civilizations thousands of years old, uh, some say... 4,000 years for the Chinese, sorry. Their civilization starts from the Qin dynasty. That is where the name comes, Qin, China, which is around 200. They were small, small principalities. They fought against each other. They talk of a Zhao dynasty going back to 2000 BC. There is nothing. No archaeological excavation, no written records, no anything. What we need to understand is they were an agrarian society. One group on the north, on the Yellow River, which is the Huang Ho. It's called yellow because of the heavy silt that it carries and gives the water a yellowish tinge. So the Englishman called it the Yellow River. And to the south, you have Yangtze. These are two very different cultures. People have to understand that. Very different cultures. Different dialect. North is Mandarin. South is Cantonese. Yes. But Cantonese is... Pretty much dead and buried now. Because the ma- North and people conquered speak it, them. but officially. No, officially, because the North conquered it and yeah. made Mandarin their language. Yeah. They had that warring period. And then after that comes the Qin dynasty. Then there is a gap. Then you have the Tang. You have the North and South Song Tang. Then comes the famous Yuan. I'm talking of the major dynasties. Then you have the Yuan. These are Mongols. Mm. Kublai Khan's grandson, oh sorry, uh, Chengiz Khan's grandson, Kublai Khan, who came and captured much of China and gave them almost the area that they are asking for now, which they're claiming. After that came Ming, which was theirs. Last was the Qing dynasty. Qing dynasty is the one which was able to conquer Tibet, whole of Xinjiang, most of uh, what The people called Eastern Turkestan, which is the Central Asian states, Mongolia. They came from Mongolia. And the Qing dynasty is actually Manchu. Mm. So when you look at China, there was a map which we had made viral also. And C3S had also built on it and given the colors. The heartland China is essentially between these two rivers. Sichuan is also not part of Han heartland. Mm. That is China. Manchuria is a conquered area. Manchus, see, when you look at the people talk of Great Wall of China being the longest wall in the world. Sorry, it is not. It is in bits and pieces. Multiple kings and emperors to protect themselves from the Manchus and the Mongols made these walls. It is not one straight wall. It's not a single wall running all through. So how big are the gaps? The gaps are narrow, about 10-15 kilometers, which from high altitude you can't see. But when you actually map it, you realize that there are deviations. The the wall ends here, then another wall from another kingdom starts there. Were there natural barriers that required? No, they made these. I see. They have made this. They deployed thousands and thousands of troops. God knows how many millions have died there. Making this wall and how many thousands died guarding this wall which never protected them. If this wall had to protect them, how did the Mongols come and conquer them? So if they claim that they have a claim on Mongolia, I'm sorry. Mongolia actually has a claim on you. Because they were, Kublai Khan was a Mongol. And then similarly, the Manchurians, Manchus, which they call the Shenyang province, actually have a claim on you, Mm. on the Hans. But having conquered all these areas and then subsequently came the Han migration and most of these areas have been Hanized now. Including they are trying to do with Xinjiang. Yes, including Xinjiang. And uh, it's a 
cause for concern that millions and millions of people are being tortured and kept in so-called re-education camps. And the Muslim world has nothing to say for it. As I say in Hindi, paisa bolta hai. Of course, of course. Um, so, viewers, uh, when you get a chance, watch this movie called The Great Emperor. It talks about the end of the dynasty and how the uh, communists are slowly taking over. And also that the last emperor, and I think not la great emperor, the last emperor. Last emperor. The last emperor. And, and that person again is from Manchurian descent. And the Japanese attack uh, yes. and take over Manchuria. And, and then, they make him a puppet yeah, king, king and all and that. So, oh, though in the book, I have given very brief about this, but more is uh, charting the lessons learnt by the Communist Party of China. Communist Party of China, when we look at uh, China per se, there is PRC and there is ROC. ROC is in Taiwan. Across both the states, their uh, mentor is a person called Dr. Sun Yat Sen. Mm -hmm. Yes. In 1905, much before communism came into four, he gave them the three principles. Nationalism, controlled democracy with welfareism, which is socialism, that is socialist democracy. And the last was a centrally controlled economy. Yeah. And then in 1922, because he is the first one who overthrew the last emperor and created a Republic of China in 1912 with the help of the army of the north, Beiyang. So when you say Beiyang, Beiyang is the north army. At I think Yang something was the name of that general. He overthrew uh, Sun Yat-sen and he wanted to be the emperor become the emperor again because it is there in the DNA of the Chinese that the emperor is the be all and end all and maibap and he has the mandate from heaven to rule. Yeah. That was I the thought it was the same of Japan also until they modernized. Uh, modernized, yeah. yeah. That uh, 1800s, 1800s yeah. 70s and all yeah. the uh, they started the uh, renaissance period for themselves. Yeah. But here they still follow that mandate from heaven. And that mandate, since the power that controlled the Han heartland was were the northerners. So the fate depended always on the movement of the Yellow River. Yellow River has very heavy silt. So it it is untamable in the sense that it shifts its course by almost a thousand kilometers where it ends in the sea. Mm. It will come down below Beijing to north. So, if you look at the uh, timelines of where all it has shifted and you can link the timeline to the overthrow of the empire mm. and the emperor because uh, they were agrarian. So, if there was famine in one area and floods in the other area because suddenly the river has changed course and all your crops have got flooded and the other area there is no water. So, the, there are no crops. So, uh, you found that there was a revolution. To overcome that, that is the time in uh, 6th, 7th uh, century BC that they started making canals from south to the north mm. to link basically so that if there is a change in the river direction, at least water from Yangtze, they can pump it up and mm. do it. Mm. So that is where these you find that the Chinese are very good in civil engineering, mm. making canals, making tunnels. They have mastered that over the generations. But he, that is the time when he went around entire China, then went to the West. And in 22, he wrote a book called International Development of China. It is available in the PDF, but be careful to see that you get all the maps. There are about 16 to 18 maps, colored maps of China where he has laid down where to make the ports, make to make the roads, the railway lines, the electrification. So he had thought it all out in his head. All out and he had put it in paper. And taking aid from the West to surpass the West. And that was the place where he had written to colonize because those was the uh, kingdom uh, time of colonies, 1920s and all colonies were still there. 
colonize he had said starting from the north manchuria then you come to mongolia then you come to the he had given a name to the sichuan and gansu province i'll tell you why sichuan and gansu province then was turkestan eastern, eastern turkestan tibet tibet when he says he included ladakh going right up to gilgit baltistan nepal bhutan and of course tibet he also included south arunachal uh, sorry south tibet was north arunachal so these were the seven regions he said you need to colonize it is there in black and white in his book anybody who reads that you can see it one interesting fact that i found out uh, general rajiv is that both the taiwanese and the chinese swear by dr sun yatsen yes Hassan. yes i am coming to that <laughs> go ahead sir i'm coming jumping the gun here <laughs> yeah like i said cross straits because he established the republic of china right. and the republic of china has shifted to taiwan and his protege was chiang kai shek the best part is you were wanting a democracy and other things but you took the assistance of soviet union to tackle the japanese chiang kai shek because he came back he again became the president but he died early by 1925 sun yat sen was dead his protege was chiang kai shek by then the communist party had come in thanks to yeah, again yeah. soviet union thanks to soviet union communist party in 1921 had been established in china initially they did not have any uh, militia or armed force and they suddenly realized that the uh, republic had a national republican army which was contesting at various places so they started off in 27 first august 27 is the birth of the pla of the militia of the workers and peasants but what they did was they started subverting the uh, nra generals and soldiers and the komintang people that was the backdrop to the fight between the nra and the communist party in the late 20s early 30s leading to the long march and they learnt about how to subvert and gain control through lenin mao learnt it from lenin he if people read the history of lenin he he came from a bourgeois class it was basically his brother who had a sort of you could say a difference of opinion with the prince and he was executed with a vengeance he went after the nick czar that how can you execute on difference of opinion and that was the birth and the rise of the communist party to based on a personal agenda and then he died and mao took over and did everything they learnt it from that and when you look at the long march please remember he went north shanzi is to the north next door to soviet union mongolia was part of soviet union so that they could get all the aid from that if people think that mao regrouped there and was able to well he had only 5 6000 people left with him you don't find th- fight an army of lakhs of people with 5 6000 he subverted the people around he wrote out his red book out there where he found that chiang kai shek was uh, no torch bearer for goodness he was a total dictator and the people were in terror of him so that is where he wrote the root, uh, red book and the eight points which i have given in my book of what the red army as it was called then the soldier should do that if you take something from the uh, people you got to pay for it look after them they resolve their problems all these things and that is how he subverted those people gained equipment weapons and equipment from russia russia hardly ever fought the japanese some guerrilla attacks bulk the brunt was borne 
by Chiang Kai-shek yes. and NRC. Yes. I mean, one story, one theory that do, does the rounds is that Chiang Kai-shek was so tired from engaging with the Japanese that one, when Japanese finally stopped, like at the end of the Second World War, 45 to 49 period, that these guys then decided Russia used you know, Russia's help to attack. attack. And Chiang Kai-shek turned to US. He actually converted to Christianity. He, he went to US. I think he even married uh, something. Some Christian. Know. Yeah, right. He tried all these things, but the, the Americans, like any other campaign, they didn't have their mind or heart in it. And he was forced to uh, flee yeah, the Yeah, because he had, they had suffered a lot of casualties. The Americans' aid only started coming in after Pearl Harbor. Hmm. Prior to that, he was told, Chiang Kai-shek himself, despite knowing that the Soviet Union is helping Mao, was dependent on weapons and equipment with Mao. Yeah. And the Soviet Union kept trying to tell them that both of you should fight together. But in actuality, they were telling Mao to only do guerrilla warfare and leaving NRA to yeah. fight. Yeah. Yeah. So at the end of the Second World War, uh, the NRA was ragged. But Mao was rejuvenated. People forget that all these claims that uh, Sun Yat-sen had made in the book was passed in the parliament by Chiang Kai-shek. In uh, Taiwanese parliament or Chinese? No, between 45 to 47. Oh, yeah, that they were in power at that time. Yes. Yeah. Civil war started in 47 and they won in 49. Between 45 to 47, it was a 11 dash line, hmm. which included Vietnam because North Vietnam was with the communists. Correct, correct. Okay. Correct. It was when the communists came to power and they were helping the Viet Cong when Mao dropped these two at the insistence of Ho Chi Minh. Hmm. The two in Haiphong Bay, the two dashes were dropped and it became nine dash. Hmm. But people forget that all these claims and even that 11 dash line was passed in the parliament by Chiang Kai-shek. And till date, has the Taiwanese assembly rescinded that? No. no. Uh, also another story, sir. I, I'm, this is the turning point there. This guy does all the hard work and then he's driven out. And one, two other reasons for why he was driven out because you are a... Uh, you know, you are much more versed with the Chinese history than I am. I get to hear bits and pieces. One theory goes that Stalin kept Chiang Kai-shek's son as hostage. And therefore, Chiang Kai-shek couldn't do a whole lot unless, you know, you need to... Oh, I wouldn't go much by that theory. Mm. Essentially, it is that the NRA had run, been run ragged. Mm. The Japanese were... All said and done, tremendous fighters. Yes, yes. The Americans also learnt it. Yeah. And at the end of the Second World War, the Americans were also ragged. They had suffered, and see, they never permitted any other uh, nation to come in the Pacific to fight correct, for them. Correct. Because as per Monroe Doctrine, Pacific is their backwaters. And they will not permit any European power to come there. It stands even today. Mm. That is the background to AUKUS coming in to throw the French out from there. Yeah, yeah. No presence there. And that Atlantic and all, you keep doing what you want. But Americans were also dead tired. War fatigue had set in. A lot of casualties they had taken place. And they didn't want to get into another fight in a similar manner in unfamiliar terrain now. Then they again got into Korea not long later. They had to get into Korea because the, uh, to, uh, McCarthyism had come in and was rising up at that time, uh, anti-communism wave. Right. And Korea was going to become communist. Mm. But what happened? You fought for so many years and you went back to that same 38th parallel from where the war started. Yeah. The flaw was making that 38th parallel at the end of the war. Right. Why didn't you put it at Yalu River? If you had put it at Yalu River, then ho this whole thing wouldn't have taken place. Correct, correct. But you kept it in between mm. and the whole problem started. And you won the war only because you threatened China with a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the US had just done, used them yes, twice. So. twice and you threatened them with nuclear weapon. And that's where the, I would say, an armistice was signed. By the way, this is the only line in the world where war has not stopped. There's no 
peace treaty signed. Mm. It's an armistice mm. between North and South Korea. <laughs> so when we <laughs> scream that North Korea is doing A, B, C, D, keep in mind, there's no peace treaty. <laughs> this. So having, they, like I said, the Taiwanese have not yet rescinded that. They have very much, of course, they became a uh, democracy much, much, much that later 60s, in life. Right? 60s or 70s. Which one? Uh, Taiwan becoming a democracy. No, 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 no. 92. 92. Okay. So, yeah, it was not like when he no, came no. over. No, no. Chiang Kai-shek was there. Then he died. He handed over power to his son. Then when his son became too old in 87, that is when the democracy was, he started shifting towards it. And 92, they shifted to democracy and proper 96, you had a two-party democracy. Saying 92, you went to democracy, there was only Kuomintang. Right. Then you had the Taiwan People's Party, the Demo first came the uh, DPP, Democratic People's Party, and then you had the TPP, which come in now. So they are uh, of late. So sometimes I laugh when they try to talk of democracy and what democracy. But they have not rescinded till date all these in uh, their uh, assembly, national assembly. So how are you so certain and sanguine that if and when democracy takes root in mainland China and these people come there, they'll change. <laughs> they have had so many years to change, yes. which they have not done. It's almost about more than seven and a half decades. It's True. Nothing, uh, yeah. nothing has happened. So, now the crux is that is where they created the strategy. See, earlier we used to be mass attacks. When you go in for mass attacks, even if you don't have weapon, you know that the other person is going to run out of at ammunition at some point in time. And people are suffering, your soldiers are suffering casualties, you don't have the weapon. The people who are coming from behind, they pick up the weapon of the fallen soldier and keep fighting. Right, right. That was the mass attack which Mao had said. And uh, Mao also, we need to see that he did not abide by what Sun Yat Sen had said. He tried his own with great leap forward and that was a catastrophe. Millions and millions and millions died of famine. He was at his weakest moment and Nehru served India on a platter to him, 62 war. He regained his strength. Otherwise, he was totally isolated and he was almost going to be thrown out. And so, what was the reason for Nehru to do that? He was not a realist. Hmm. He used to have its own concept. We made Panchil, you know, I am not a threat to anybody else, so nobody will attack me. Real world doesn't work in that manner. Actually, he wanted to disband the army, didn't yes, he? Yes, he said, I don't need the army. No, no, no I only need, if you know this. <laughs> I, I need only the police. Yeah. The same uh, useless thing his son is also speaking. Yes. When he says, I need the farmers and others, you can go and fight. What is he talking? Okay. So, like, like uh, I would say, grandfather like son or great grandfather and great grandson. And great -grandson. So, uh, he was not a realist. He had uh, a very high opinion of himself, which is sad. He would have made a good foreign minister with a strong PM to tell him. So, the actual good thing would have been that if uh, Sardar Patel was the PM and he was the foreign minister, the whole history would have changed. But then uh, the British never wanted Sardar Patel because that is my theory if you look at it. Let us say there are three of us. So, there is that person and I am his enemy and you are his friend. Okay. And he has to give up what he is holding. Whom will he give it up to? Your enemy or your, or your friend? Right? So, however much the Communist Party and the Congress Party may say that uh, the then Hindu Mahasabha and all were pro-British, 
if they were so pro british why wasn't the power handed over to them mm. correct good question yeah why was the power then handed over to congress that is point number 1 point number 2 till i would say 19 18 19 19 1920 the leader of the congress party used to be at the forefront of all the movement yes when i say forefront he would lead correct and they used to be beaten up thrown in jail yes. done everything in fact lala lajpat rai lost his life for yes it. because of that yes right hence the bhagat singh saga yeah now where were jinnah gandhi and nehru in all the movements that they started except for dandi march with a claim he led i doubt tum zara bhaga samne jao main peeche aa raha hu and they used to get arrested very easily and they would go and sit in beautiful jails i have seen some of the so called jails like the place uh, my i am from the amad kor our alma mater is in ahmednagar ramat ko central school ahmednagar fort was the place where Nehru was incarcerated, so-called, where he wrote the discovery of India. Did he write it? No, that is the claim. <laughs> For three years he was there. If you are in jail, you are supposed to be in solitary confinement. You have, for those times, a beautiful cot with mosquito net, and you have your own uh, attached toilet. and you have a sofa set for visitors you have a table you have chair you have writing material what are you telling me incarcerated it is still maintained if somebody goes to ahmednagar fort please go and have a look at this place similarly gandhi during quit india movement was incarcerated where aga khan palace hello whereas the others were thrown into kala pani and god knows which all jails yes yes how come okay you say discard uh, foreign clothes damn good you were wearing your dhoti chhota sa dhoti and all that excellent but when you came within india when you were called for any conference any movie clip you see which is the vehicle you stepping out of rolls royce yeah so why didn't you quit that and come in a bullock cart or a horse cart or a buggy why was he coming in rolls royce all the way from wherever he was there only he can answer this okay yeah. so and so like i said if you're going to hand over power and you want to retain control over this you'll give it to whom you trust so you think that there may have been a side letter deal between gandhi of and course. the british so that even though 15 out of 16 or 14 out of 15 pradesh councils of congress elected Sardar Patel and zero for Nehru, by the way. One was for Acharya Kripalani. You have to go back and watch that movie, 1993, magnum opus called Sardar, um, it, where this guy Parish Rawal is actor. Yeah, Sardar, a very beautifully made movie. So, um, sir, let let's get back to our dragon. Yeah. So the dragon. So he broke away, and they paid the price because of the great leap forward. And then once he regained strength after the 62 war, he Uh, tried to regain full control there were still voices against him liu shaoqi who was the uh, president was there so in 67 he said let me attack india again mm. and that was when he attacked in nathula and he got a thrashing he got a very bad thrashing in nathula and chola in sikkim he wanted to overcome sikkim got thrashed very badly 4 500 in just one battle the soldiers were killed the pla was scared to attack uh, general sagat was the person who was there at that time who did that and uh, so he shifted because he had just started the cultural revolution great proletariat revolution the cultural revolution in 66 and 67 he went full pelt with his red brigade and uh, liu shaoqi the president was removed in 68 and he was killed in prison and he purged all the people we all know what happened to lin piao and lin piao was his second in hand and he was getting concerned so he did a deal 
resigned from everything and he was escaping in his aircraft with his family to Soviet Union, it was shot down. And you said it was, he died in a plane crash. It carried on till he survived. He died in 76. His wife and three more tried to gain control, gang which is the gang of four. But Tang Xiaoping, who had twice been purged by him, he had already worked his way within the party. He overthrew all of them. But there were still remnants of those uh, opposition there. And that is why he went into Vietnam. Mm -hmm. That is 77? 79. 79. 79. 79. Of course, they got a thrashing of their lives. They may say that we achieved the end, they achieved nothing. It was because Vietnam had gone against uh, Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge, and they gone in an overthrow. If he felt that they have won, uh, Vietnam didn't pull out of Cambodia till almost about 91, mm -hmm. They controlled Cambodia. So, after that, then he shifted focus. By then, the open the uh, links to US had already started. Pakistan keeps jumping that we were the one who provided them. Sorry. When somebody comes as a hop, step and jump to some place to refuel and then go, doesn't mean you did that. If you read the history, uh, it was around 69 that Mao gave the outreach to the US via the Polish embassy. Mm. Because their economy wasn't tatters absolutely the way it is today yeah, yeah it was in tatters and it took kissinger came in 71 which was when the uh, he had a halt a quiet halt in pakistan so that it didn't attract attention and he went to china pakistan was chosen because it was backwaters and nobody it was in nobody's limelight at that point in time and though the Pakistanis make much of it today that they facilitated, nobody facilitated. It was direct. And that was the ping pong. But despite that opening, it was only in 79 with Jimmy Carter that actually the relations firmed in. They were put into the uh, UN. They came into the P5 at the expense of Taiwan. But the UN Charter still talks of Republic of China. That's true. It doesn't talk of PRC. That charter has not been changed. So, 79 Something onwards. similar with Soviet Russia and, and <laughs> yeah, Russia. Russia also. <laughs> yeah, it's Soviet USSR, yes. but Russia is there. Yes. And 79 onwards, then he started working on this book which Sun Yat Sen had done started doing all the deals with the Americans, concurrently made out, strategized all the thought of Sun Yat-sen and how to put it in place. And that is where you find the major shift in their method of functioning. Hide your claws, bide your time, never take leadership. Uh, all his lectures have not been translated to English, but uh, there are a lot of then who were very pro PRC, like Michael Pillsbury, uh, Kissinger, to name a few, to name a couple. In their writings, they have said they have been able to read these. So they said, Tang Xiaoping had said from 85, it will take them a hundred years to become a power. And till then was this, that hide your claws, bide your time, stay calm, never take leadership. And then after 100 years, you come to, you are strong enough to emerge as a power. And in that, the classic concept he evolved was comprehensive national power. Now, otherwise, the Western construct of national power deals only with economy, military and diplomacy. Mm he brought in a human element. Mm. So there was a fourth vertical he brought in, human element. There are various matrices when you try to read, various uh, theorists have given various uh, sub points within these. But these are the four main verticals. And a very clear learning from the time they came to existence and through 
this period was if you subvert the human after all who builds the economy of a country the human who provides strength to the military the human who provides you the diplomatic strength it's a human it's a human being in all three so if you have subverted the human you weakened these three so the entire thrust has been how to subvert and weaken the countries internally and they have been at work within india and in their neighborhood since the 50s and you can imagine with the reflexive control that you had such a powerful air force in 62 war nehru refused to use the air force there's so many questions there that come to my mind uh, for example his over reliance on one individual whose oratory brilliance floored him and and basically But, see the issue is that that was all that was there in nehru also he would speak very well you listen to him the way he speaks is really good but that's what it is you needed somebody to give substance correct right but since his oratory skills were very good his writing skills to add to what you questioned about the book <laughs> is pathetic because whatever interaction i have had through my service with the mea they have no noting sheet given out why he did what he did and for posterity whenever you are taking any policy decisions the noting sheets are very important because you pen your views as to why you are saying What something led up to you making a certain yeah decision. a certain decision yeah. a cert the decision has come out as a letter but why did that decision come that background has comes in a noting sheet any office that you go to the first thing like i uh, from my upbringing in the pune house Uh, my parent unit has always been that you occupy a chair you open up all the previous files and read the notings because the thinking was that the person preceding you was not a fool to be sitting correct, on that chair correct correct he had a point of view and he would and there was an environment and a point of view in which a decision was taken everything is placed there now if you want to change something or do something else now you continue on that noting that these were the environments so the decision now the environment has changed and so this is the logic and why you want to change right. you don't just write okay now you do this so for posterity it is lost you never know why he took a decision true okay. true, true, true so that was the crux and they shifted from the mast attacks towards a Uh, you could say a uh, combined arms concept which is not integrated and then he had postulated his war zone campaign theory uh, which is to take on a, a regional country individually it's anathema to them if they these countries align or partner with themselves then the war zone campaign fails the war zone campaign is also not for a super power or a major power and it fails again if the major power aligns with a particular regional power now you take your mind think about it why do they scream against quad and other groupings mm. because whatever tang shaoping had thought and they have not had anyone else post him who could think zero uh, it fails so how do you fight okay so the main thing in that is today from people's war it is people at war they have learnt the from the american way how the americans have utilized their economic strength and their military might to infiltrate and their education institutions to infiltrate every aspect of governance in a lot of countries engdal had written a beautiful book though it was published i think in 
it's called full spectrum dominance but this concept of full spectrum dominance has been in discussion since the 80s and 90s and especially after 92 when they uh, spoke of the unipolar moment after soviet union crumbled they also learned their lesson from the gulf war the first gulf war shock and awe so in the late 90s between 94 to 90 Eight, they had a series of discussions on future wars and they identified six combats which included space, cyber, robotics, you name it, long range, non-contact, kinetic, non-kinetic and they had published it in 98. Michael Pillsbury uh, translated it and published it in 2001 too. Mm. And we are all talking of that today, so that much you have to grant their military those thinkers, I, I won't say the military, the scholars yeah. in their Academy of Military Sciences. The Academy of Military Sciences is the one which lay, uh, lays down their uh, strategy and concept and doctrine. The latest one was published in 2013. Okay. And all these, they keep shifting. Whatever they do, they base themselves to think, what is my CNP today? I have signed the treaty. If once my CNP increases, I bunk that treaty and say, okay, let's have talks again. So that is where you find that they keep shifting their goalposts as per the their perceived strength. And in 99, they enunciated the unrestricted warfare. This is the uh, translation by the Americans. That is not the correct translation. They have now realized it also and most of the scholars now say it is not unrestricted warfare. It is called warfare beyond rules. Mm, warfare beyond rules. There are no rules. And it is a nation at war with everybody. General, um, there is a writing in, uh, there is a writing in um, Sun Tzu's work that he advocates war and peace with the same country at the same time. Yes. Why go to Sun Tzu? Our own Chanakya, there are two types of warfare. One is Prakrit, which is your normal warfare, it is in front. The other is Kut Yud, the quiet hidden war. And within that is what is unrestricted warfare is Tushnim warfare. Mm. Gauda Yud, Tushnim mm. warfare is how to reduce the strength of your enemy internally. We talk of right. uh, Sun Tzu and Sun Tzu had also the main thing which they follow are two things. Winning, the acme of generalship is winning without fighting. And the second part is if you have to fight, ensure victory before you join a fight. So um, let's, let's try and connect the dots between China and India as to what has Please. By the way, I'm looking at his notes. Not a single error. <laughs> Very clarity of thought is coming through here. We can't show it to you, but I just glanced at it. It's not a single strike. Mine will be text between strikes, sir. Here there is no strikes. <laughs> so, since he is wanting to fight in unrestricted warfare, there is a concept of psychological warfare, legal warfare and media warfare, which has been combined together and called the three warfares strategy. It is not a separate strategy per se. It is a subset of the unrestricted warfare right. because this war beyond rules covers military, transmilitary and non-military domain. Everything you can imagine on the earth is there, whether drugs or whether human trafficking, anything and everything to uh, break the morale of the people. The aim is once the morale is broken, he has burnt you from inside. He doesn't need a Fanne Khan army. Even an average or a below average army which comes and stands on your border, you, you don't have the will to fight. So you're ready that, okay, let me do whatever I can deal with him so that at least I can douse the fires inside. Right. Okay. So for that, what does he need? essentially. And when you look at the prioritization of his expenditure from the defense budget that he gives out, it is very clear. 
Number one is the strategic support force, which looks after space, cyber, information, warfare, everything. Number two is the rocket force, which is the long range, uh, non-contact. Number three is the Navy, so that he can come on to your ports. Number four is the Air Force. But unfortunately, he doesn't, uh, Xi Jinping has broken everything. Uh, he has dumped whatever Tang Xiaoping had done, which was followed by Chiang Zemin and Hu Jintao to a large extent. He has thrown that into the gutter. He has gone back to becoming more Mao than Mao himself. So, uh, here the biggest problem is whatever you had identified that people are not able to understand uh, what is to be done. They are not able to execute their plans properly and if the uh, training is to be done, they are not able to train properly. All that exists today because future wars like what we train for is called a directive style of command in the sense that as a commander I will give my vision and say that that is my primary objective and in the process you need to secure these areas that's it how you do it at the lower level is your baby because there will be fleeting opportunities in the battlefield. If you are looking back, you will miss that. And as the technology is coming in in a big way, which we call the disruptive uh, disruption in military affairs, not revolution, these uh, opportunities that you get, the time window will be very small. You got to very quickly make use of that. If you don't and you keep looking back, uh, you miss the battle and uh, you will get into a grind and suffer casualties. China today, unfortunately, the manner in which Xi Jinping has taken control follows it not an autocratic, a dictatorial style of command. He will give the plan and say, do this. But he has no experience of military. The only two people in his CMC who have today any experience worth anything in his military, one whom he calls his blood brother, Chang Yu Jia, who is the vice chairman. He is at the moment under a cloud because of the equipment department investigation which is going on and he has purged so many people. He was a company commander in 79 war with Vietnam. What he learnt I don't know because they got a thrashing. Then to force the Vietnamese to get out of Cambodia in 91, 89 to 91, they had uh, occupied certain heights on the border in the Liaoning province with Vietnam, closer towards Cambodia. That time, Chang Yu Jia was a regiment commander and in his regiment, his number two in the CMC below him, the next vice chairman, Hu Vidong, was a platoon commander. Mm. They haven't fought a war till since then. Right. Now, what kind of operational or strategic understanding would a company commander or a platoon commander understand or you as a regiment commander you just went and occupied one hill feature what kind of uh, operational strategic or even grand strategic uh, understanding you would have is open to question the concept they are all following is still what Tang Xiaoping had left for them so now the problem has come is in the strategic support force uh, commander and his uh, political commissar were purged and a new one has been brought in. Reasons have not been given by. Rocket force, everybody knows. Correct. The amount of purges that have taken place. And you brought in a non-rocket force chap Correct. from the Air Force there. And you placed a political commissar who is almost two years senior to him on top of him. Normally, the political commissar is junior to the commander. Here you place somebody from the Navy who is about two years senior to him. Now, what will that man know about rocket force and how he is going to function? Because it's a totally different environment of functioning. I don't know. So, that leaves a question mark. The PLA Navy, the less said the better, it's still a brown Navy. You can keep saying uh, that I have three aircraft carriers. Till date, I have not seen at least any carrier battle group being deployed and exercised as a carrier battle group by the PLA Navy. The second aircraft carrier, Liaoning, which they had uh, 
handed over to the Navy way back in 2019-20, has always been in Dalian, their base. Mm. It came out into the Navy, went back in 2019-2020, it was back in Dalian. It came out last year for the supposedly blockade of Taiwan. It just had one aircraft carrier, two frigates, one from South Fleet and one from North Fleet and a chota sa a logistics support force. It was supposed to be 72 hours. An aircraft carrier can be self-contained for 15 to 30 days. For 72 hours, you want a logistic ship with it. Where was the battle group? You don't deploy an aircraft carrier with just two frigates. What the uh, Americans will chew them for breakfast <laughs> or even the starters for breakfast. <laughs> they don't need. Having done that, it's back in Dalian. It was there precisely, movement and back to Dalian took five days, back in Dalian. And the press report says it is for upgrade. Hello, you made it only in 2019. It's just five years and you want an upgrade. The third one which they are making, the deck has got there, torn There's off. a saying that if you want to lie, lie smartly. Yeah. <laughs> the third one, I don't know when it will come because they are trying to copy the Americans to make the steam launched. And uh, well, whenever you do that, the stresses on the body of the ship is enormous and it was evident. The uh, tail end of the deck, launching deck across uh, horizontally and almost the whole length and almost uh, two thirds of the length vertically on one flank got torn open. Now they are saying they are doing some trials and other things. So you can have aircraft carriers, but you don't have trained manpower. Uh, when they went across to Taiwan, they launched in the three days about 40 sorties. When our ship goes, actual exercise, 40 sorties you do in a day. I'm not even talking of night. <laughs> so it's not so simple. So it's a big question mark. And PLAF, you can uh, look at PLA, PLA Air Force only if it is a strategic air force. It's not yet strategic. You still have a number of aircrafts which cannot do air-to-air -air refueling. And air-to-air -air refueling, you can speak to any of the pilots, you, fighter pilots, you know, it's not so easy. Just imagine in the middle of the air, there's a tiny cup and the prong that you have, you have to take it out and it has to go exactly into that. The margin of error is very less. You need a very highly trained pilot and you got to regularly fly for it. So now the defense budget also indicates this. So that means the ground force is the weakest link today. Of course, the others are struggling is the weakest link today. Today, I don't know what its status will be 10 years down the line. It could be better. It is not today and that is why the PLA, when he is pushing for preparing for war, uh, last to last month, there was an article which came out in PLA Daily. Now, PLA Daily is controlled by the CMC. They said they were not ready for war. Yes, they are not yet ready for war, which tells you there is a deep divide within the CMC and the PLA himself. And that it got published, of course. Within four or five days, they removed it. But that it was published itself is a major, 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 major thing. So the construct that they have is to subvert from within. So I'll recommend a book for you, uh, very well written by N.C. Bipindra. It's available in uh, Amazon. It is called, uh, I'll just give you the name. Oh. Yeah, Mapping Chinese Footprints and Influence in India. They have already spent, till the book was published in 2021, 10,000 crores. That's a lot of in money. In subverting. No, you, can, you see it? In day to day, you see it? <laughs> yeah, I'm in Tamil Nadu. Yeah. I don't shy away from things. The Hindu is totally bought off. Hindu is just the tip of the iceberg, Mouth sir. Is, no, I'm saying Hindu is like the... Global Times of India is the mouthpiece of the Communist Party. You can never write anything. Okay, you have think tanks. You have universities. Any university which has two things. One of the two things. A Confucius Institute or a China Study Center. Means it's been bought off by the yeah. Chinese. 
So that is funded totally everything done by the Chinese. So they can't go anything away from the Chinese. You have political parties, the communist parties, all shades are with them. And can we forget our the heir apparent of the INC signing a deal with the Communist Party of China in 2008. The photo is available in the media. You can have a look at it. He has signed it. So is there any surprise that he is going off and on regularly outside the country on secret missions to meet George Soros minions? George Soros assists the Chinese. What exactly do you think he signed in that? I think that they see the moment you look at it, that they will uh, assist the Chinese access to the Indian market. What all the decisions post 2008 signing, they have destroyed you, trying to destroy your MSMEs. That's two, right. That's right. Yeah. By two things way, immediately got destroyed. Your solar market, which has now started coming back yeah. again with the imposition of uh, e extra tax on the Chinese. Solar market, you were very good. They destroyed that. Your mobile phones. Mm. 